Good morning. Uh, A very good morning to you. It is the uh, 19th, is it? The, the, no, it is, yes, it's the 19th of January. Already it is the 19th of January. Where has this month gone? And uh, we are heading towards uh, a, a very exciting weekend in Lewis because it's the Speakers Festival. We've got all sorts of famous people wandering the streets here to talk about their books, about their life, uh, and to uh, give us a little bit of background uh, of the uh, expertise that they have in their daily work and uh, i have no expertise whatsoever except i'm a mouse and uh, so you've got to have to put up with me for a little while this morning and uh, i hope that we can keep you amused and entertained uh, let's uh, let, let's see what we got cooking in the parlor uh, i have no idea yes we uh, um we we actually uh, well had a little bit of trouble getting on the air again this morning um but uh, <laughs> as, uh we, we, we'll, uh, we'll, 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 we'll try we will try and uh, we'll see uh, what we have going for us um uh, i haven't got any jingles and tingles and singles uh, and uh, so what we'll do is we'll go straight to the newspapers and uh, uh, the uh, headlines uh, across the papers this morning are uh, Kate's brave face and the biggest NHS strikes ever. So the Metro is, uh, it, it actually has a, a, a strip uh, headline as Kate puts on a brave face. And it says, uh, uh, Kate, the uh, Duchess of Cambridge, uh, was meeting some children yesterday and uh, she made a joke about a, a face mask. Uh, and that she's putting on a very brave front, uh, despite all the mayhem that's going around her. God bless her. I, I don't think she thought that she was going to sign up for this uh, in, in marrying into the royal family. But by golly, she's going through a test of fire. And she's coming out very well. She looks gracious. Uh, she looks in the model of Diana, cool, calm and collected. And uh, very pretty she is too. Uh, but uh, now we get down to the nitty-gritty with the Metro is Mr. Coffee Bean. Now, is, uh, the, the, the reference is to Jeremy Hunt, who uh, decided to have a, a video made to explain inflation using coffee cups. And, <laughs> and of course, the, uh, the purists have picked up on it straight away. It's probably not a bad idea to start off with, uh, but uh, he... he picked up uh, 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 on it and, uh, and, and bollocks it, to put it uh, bluntly. So that now everybody is laughing and uh, saying, what on earth is uh, is going on? Uh, and uh, I have to say that, you, you know, Tony Blair uh, ruined the PR industry. At one time, we had the Central Office of Information, which was a, an independent government organization without any political bias whatsoever to put out government... Uh, government stuff. Uh, but uh, Tony Blair decided to follow Tricky Dicky Nixon, who introduced the spin doctor. In other words, put the best possible spin on any news that you possibly can. And that was uh, the end of independent uh, PR for the government. And actually, it also changed the industry. I don't find that PR people now are terribly helpful, uh, that they are uh, quite biased, quite dismissive. There used to be the old uh, uh, flack and hack. And the flack was the, uh, the, the the PR man who was putting forth his client's point of view. And the hack, of course, was the journalist. And it was always said that there wasn't much between them. Uh, now there is a lot between them. And the uh, the, the flacks, uh, the PR people, have seemed to have lost the skill. Uh, I put it down to uh, lack of training again is nobody wants to train anybody anymore. They throw them in at the deep end and they give them a computer and say, there, use that. And that's not good enough. It's not good enough. 
and it adds to the mayhem that we've got going for us uh, at the moment, right through our industry, through the uh, quangos, through government, uh, it is not good enough. We need people who are trained. We also need people who see these things as a vocation, not as a way to a healthy bank account. That's undermining the whole essence of this country, where we were always taught, I was taught at school to have a sense of duty, and that I must think of my country uh, and my society as well as myself. In fact, it was John F. Kennedy who made the famous uh, statement is, uh, think not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Oh, we got a nice uh, sounding BBB. Is, uh, uh, oh, it's the police dashing up the high street. I wonder what that's about. Uh, anyway, uh, the, the, the PR people for Jeremy Hunt, and he should know better because he was the Minister of, of uh, Media and Culture at one time, uh, is, uh, have uh, dumped him in it. And I'm not very surprised. But it goes without saying, uh, it follows on. It turns on uh, very much in uh, the, the, the theme of what's happening to our society is nobody gives a feed. They really don't. And uh, we're all me, me, me. And it's the beginning of the show. And uh, society has got a veneer now. It is not got in depth concern. And it doesn't matter what you're talking about local politics, national politics, national. I mean, the banks are a disgrace. Uh, uh, the, uh, the corporate sector uh, is, uh, uh, while everybody's worrying about whether they can afford to keep their house warm, is stuffing the bank accounts of their chief executives and investors full as they can with huge profits that they're making. Huge profits. They run into the billions. So what do they do? They give it back to themselves. Not on. Not on at all. No, sir. Well, uh, let's see. Go to the, the, the mirror. Uh, is uh, a, a rich Tory tells skilled nurses, budget better. The, uh, is, I mean, that, that, that's typical of what, what, what's happening. We, we've got elitists. I've always fought the idea of, of elitism. Some people are, are better than others. Some people will do better than others, will be more successful. That, that, that's natural. That's the way life is. But uh, there, there are some who uh, really uh, do not know how to handle the fact that they are wealthy. And here is a, 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 a Tory MP uh, saying nurses uh, uh, using food banks and uh, are not budgeting them, their, their income properly. Well, it's all very well for you when you don't have to worry about whether it's uh, uh, toothpaste or uh, bacon. Um, it uh, yeah, just shows how elitist I am. What I should have said is uh, whether it's, uh, it's bread uh, or, or water. Um, and uh, they, they are rightly saying, hey, who is this bloke? He's nothing better than a backbuncher, actually. He'd probably lose his seat in the next election. And the Daily Mail. Uh, and uh, as uh, Treasury suggests, Hunt has no plans to ease the tax burden in the spring budget. Conservative MPs plead with him to reconsider. Cut taxes, they say, or we're going to lose the election. And uh, uh, Jeremy Hunt and uh, uh, Richie Sunak are, are proving to be uh, quite arrogant in, in what they will do and what they won't do. They're not listening to their ministers. They're not listening to the cabinet. They are merrily sailing along. And uh, they are behaving as, as, as rich people do. You know, uh, is, uh, uh, they, they do not understand that some people have to make do on a very limited amount of money. And it's nothing to do with uh, whether they're profligate or not. Not at all. So they're being warned, but I bet you they don't pay any attention. Uh, is cut taxes or lose the election. Tories warned. The trouble is that the, go the past governments have been dictated to by the backbenchers. The tail has wagged the dog. Uh, so I rather suspect Sunak uh, wants to hang on to control, control of parliament, control of the government, and not have a bunch of backbenchers uh, rebel and create problems for him. But there are some things he must listen to and some things he must not. 
and I would suspect that right at this very time is the raising taxes we pay enough of it is is not going to be a popular uh, approach at all. The Daily Telegraph, uh, 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 Dyson, uh, the man who manufactures the uh, uh, sweepers, um, vacuum vacuum cleaners. Um, he says it's stupid and short-sighted policies that are holding back the economy. And uh, I, I think that uh, probably he has a point. Uh, he says the, um, the, the short-sightedness and stupidity uh, is uh, in the government's uh, uh, approach to the economy uh, is really holding it back. And it's about time that they got their fingers out. Uh, the, the the issue of Kate uh, is uh, has a, a, a slot for King Charles, because uh, is is Charles going to start behaving like a king? Uh, he has taken his offshore uh, uh, wind farms, and uh, he has uh, taken the money that they uh, generate, and he's put it into the public purse. He said, here, have this money to help out. Everybody's having a, a, a bad time. I happen to own these. They're making a, a, a huge profit. Will anybody follow his example? No. What they'll do is they'll bring out the fact that he talks to trees. Uh, you watch. Uh, is uh, When a member of the establishment breaks protocol uh, and sets a, a standard like that, uh, all those who are All those who are uh, wealthy don't like it because it means that there's an anticipation, an expectation that they should do the same thing. And that digs into their bank accounts. Oh, dearie, dearie, dearie me. Okay, the Daily Express, normally uh, the newspaper of the government, is uh, it, it actually goes full, full tilt on this. Uh, Charles... 250 million gift to the nation. Uh, it's 250 million uh, pounds is what this uh, uh, wind farm is uh, valued at. And he said, here, have it. You can have it. And uh, it, it, it benefits the country. Uh, the paper says uh, uh, his daughter-in-law, uh, Kate, features on the same page with the paper describing her school visit as a child's play. Charles, uh, well, th th let's see, the I, the I, prepay meter scandal grows, 99.99% of courts uh, warrants are waved through. Uh, now, th this is all about the fact that uh, a lot of people have, uh, for their energy, uh, they have a prepaid meter. Uh, they, they put in a fiber and then they use up a fiber. And when the fiber is gone, the meter goes click and it cuts off uh, their power supply. Well, in this weather, that is uh, dangerous, I would say, uh, to the least. But what the, uh, the, the power companies, the energy companies can do is uh, they, they can then uh, cut off the, the entire service to whoever it is that isn't paying the bill. And then they take them to court. They actually do take them to court. And it turns out that nobody... You know, it's the whole idea of, of a defense goes out of the window. Uh, is what should be called justice is suspended uh, because magistrates are just taking these in bulk, right? Next 500, guilty, cut it off. Yes, power companies, you're in the right. Go after them, sue them, take every, every last scrap of whatever is of value just to pay your bill. And that is a scandal. But you see, the, the trouble is, when we get into this type of situation, when we get into this sort of uh, uh, atmosphere that we have now in society, is that's when we start to see uh, who is going to play ball and who's not. And it's amazing the number of big companies that aren't playing ball. All they see is what happens in their own bubble. And it's not good enough. And it's not good enough for Hunt and, and Sunak to sit there with self-satisfied smiles on their faces, 
making statements and pronouncements about the greater good, which doesn't affect them. And we see this sort of behavior uh, by the people who should know better and shouldn't be allowed to behave like this. And frankly, I feel powerless to do anything about it except to rant about it. Bring it to somebody's attention. It really is not good enough. It is not good enough. The Times. Leveling up cash favors Southeast over the Red Wall. Uh, well, uh, the center of the, uh, the, the Times is uh, offering uh, Prime Minister Sunak uh, uh, it's accusing him uh, of uh, failing to enact the government's leveling up policy. A paper says uh, the southeast of England will be handed no more regeneration money today than the northeast, Yorkshire, and the West Midlands. Uh, there is also an image of a worried looking Olena Zelensky, uh, Ukraine's first lady, who the Times says looked close to tears after she heard about the fatal helicopter crash uh, while in Davos. And uh, that is, uh, a helicopter crashed in Ukraine yesterday, uh, wiping out about uh, 20 people, uh, some of whom were key cabinet ministers, which they can ill afford to lose uh, while they're at war with, uh, with Russia. The Daily Star, Star, don't be a donut, let us eat cake. Uh, number 10 officially urges us to ignore health uh, uh, chiefs no cakes at work advice, right? The, the health czar has said, stop eating uh, uh, cakes and, and, and sweet things. It's not doing you any good. You're getting obesity and you're not making yourselves at all well. And number 10 says, ah, go ahead, eat all the cakes you want. See, they, 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 there's no joined up government, none whatsoever, none. And they were heading as a country to a crash. I have said that the Triffids are waiting to take over the country again, to take over the world, because they're looking for weaknesses. If you don't know what a Triffid is, it is a half plant, half animal uh, who took over the world in 1950 through uh, John Wyndham and Lucas Parks, uh, science fiction writers. And uh, the, uh, the Triffids dominated for several years. And I think that the Triffids are going to come back and dominate again because we are losing control. We're losing control through computers. The slavish attitude towards computers is remarkable. People I thought were quite sensible say, oh, yeah, well, the computer says. Yes, the bloody computer does, but it's programmed. And once it's programmed, nobody bothers to change it to suit the circumstances, either individually or the, uh, in, inherent in our daily life. And it's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. We are walking into a time warp. The Financial Times. The dollar slides as global investors lower expectations of a Fed interest rate rise. Uh, the, the Fed has been steadily, as indeed most central banks, been uh, uh, raising uh, interest rates uh, because uh, uh, that's, that's the way to calm the market. Uh, but the Fed has decided enough is enough and it's going to uh, not uh, raise the, the, the rates anymore. Now, that has a, a direct impact on currencies uh, because currencies uh, sell or traded on uh, the, the value. And uh, if there's a, a good interest rate return, that increases the value. So sometimes what's good for the rest of us is what's good for the currency. And uh, the Fed is now not going to raise interest rates, so that weakens the dollar some extent that's not a bad thing for us uh, a weaker dollar stronger pound uh, although uh, once uh, the trouble with um, currencies is that uh, you, you do one thing that is good for you and then find out that it's not very good because then things are more expensive overseas and vice versa uh, so we uh, we're uh, not in terribly good shape not terribly good shape at all uh, well, let's let's uh, let, let's see whether we can discover what is uh, going on locally, uh, and uh, we should be able to uh, 
we should be able to. And of course, uh, this morning, uh, we are not going to be able to because uh, this silly nonsense that is. Uh, um, right. Uh, let's. Uh, no, I think. What, I think. Oh, there we go. There we go. We got the papers back. Uh, so what we should be able to do is to uh, do that and that and that. And, uh, and then we can take a look at where we're at with local news. Uh, and uh, uh, one big thing is that uh, uh, a popular Sussex stores are facing administration. And I think we have one of these in Lewis, and that is a, a paper chase. Uh, and uh, it, it is uh, being forced into administration. Uh, so it means another high street uh, 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 sh shop uh, will bite the dust, weakening the, uh, the, the power and the versatility and, the, and so on of uh, the high street. Um, now, uh, uh, here are some of the uh, of main... Uh, stories another one that affects us in lewis is a former pub and hotel uh, uh, on the a27 could be turned into starbucks and that is the new market which is uh, just on the edge of lewis as you get onto the bypass uh, to go into brighton and it looks as if uh, it's it's had its day and uh, as a pub it, it's always a strange location i think because uh, it had to rely upon passing trade it didn't have uh, regulars who uh, popped in uh, for a pint after a hard day's work. And uh, it could be turned into a Starbucks coffee place. Um, uh, this uh, this uh, 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 a suspect was in a car crash, uh, was ch being chased by police, and he was found in the garden. I imagine that they got that little camera in the helicopter, which when it points down, is it makes sure that uh, we... Uh, you got you 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 can get uh, plenty of uh, idea of where uh, somebody who is being chased by the police is hiding. An influx of potholes and crest necessary to be repaired as soon as possible. Ha ha ha! That's been a constant constant battle is potholes, and uh, every time they say they're going to do something about it, they don't. Uh, two boys who beat dad in in a park in a vicious attack have had their sentences reduced. Uh, is uh, we're always reducing sentences apparently, um, and uh, it, it's uh, it's not really very good really. It's uh, not very good at all. Uh, right, a major road closed uh, again just hours after a crash. Uh, let's read the full story here, and uh, the full story here is uh, that uh, uh, we're not getting the full story. <laughs> Oh dear, dear, dear! Uh, it's, uh, it is really one of those mornings. It's, it's, uh, it's not coming through. Uh, all right, uh, let, uh, it's going to reach four today, and right now it's zero outside. It's going to be a, a, a bit of light cloud, but generally sunny. And uh, uh, everybody was saying to me, you know, Keith, you've been expounding the fact that. Uh, the middle of this week, uh, we're going to be snowbound and so on. And I was going on good faith in what the Met Office is saying and what the BBC Weather Service is saying and what many other services, uh, weather services. Uh, but in fact, the forecast for today is that it's not a bad day at all. Not a bad day at all. Uh, so where are we? Where are we in terms of the weather? It seems to defy everything. And... Uh, uh, in defining everything, it's, uh, uh, well, it's defining everything, isn't it? <laughs> uh, right, shall we? Uh, let, let, let's, let's have a, is this, this is generic? Let, let's see what it says, what it does.
Okie dokie, okie dokie. Uh, I'm fixing things on the run this morning, and uh, I'm afraid that uh, it, it, it uh, interferes with my train of thought. Uh, but um, it, 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 I, I'm sure there's something to do with the cold uh, that makes things not work the way they should. It's either that or it's the operator. Uh, ha, ha, ha. Well, it could easily be the operator uh, because I'm uh, completely and utterly hopeless at these things. And uh, uh, so what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to uh, pick something out uh, and play it uh, and uh, see whether we can actually uh, um, calm ourselves a, a little. Calm ourselves. And why not? Why not? Um, Well, just, I'm, I'm, I'm not having much luck uh, in calming myself. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, 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 nah, we're just uh, we're, we're, we're fumbling along at the moment. Just fumbling along. And uh, we uh, just have to... Uh, Tell you what, let's go to Ghost Train. It's always a good standby, and everybody loves it. Many people find commuting by train tiresome. But one of the pleasures of taking a train to London is that it passes through some of the most beautiful countryside in the UK. None more so than the view of the countryside as the line approaches Clayton Tunnel just north of Brighton. The tunnel is the longest on the line, at a mile and a quarter, running under the South Downs. It's unusual because the entrance is not the usual railway brick. It is instead designed to look like the gateway to a castle. On top is a cottage built for the railway's lightkeeper in 1849. The tunnel itself was opened in 1841 and the cottage added later. Idyllic. And after 1861, it became a nightmare, or at least for those who believe in ghostly goings-on. In August of that year, a night train left Brighton, travelling north to London. Partway through the tunnel, it stopped at what it thought was a danger signal from the light man. The engine driver was correct. The railway official had indeed given a danger signal, but the train had rushed past him before pulling up. Thinking the train had cleared the tunnel, the unfortunate lightman gave the all clear to a following train. And it slammed into the back of the first train 
in the dark, killing 23 and injuring 176 more. It was the worst ever accident on the line. And people walking on the downs over the underground passage have reported hearing the screams of the passengers as the trains pile into each other. The line is now also a direct line from Lewis. I've travelled through that tunnel a thousand times. I've never heard a scream other than the screech of the wheels and brakes. But I've never walked over the downs at that point either. And I turned down an invitation to stay in the cottage overnight. In fact, I get tense each time I go into the tunnel, knowing what had happened more than 165 years ago. But my fellow passengers carry on reading their newspapers, obviously oblivious to both the tragedy and the ghosts. I could sometimes scream at them. Ghosts of Clayton Tunnel. Eerie. Bloody eerie. I was going to abandon ship there for a moment because a monitor uh, was showing that uh, no picture coming through. But I think it was the monitor rather than uh, uh, the distribution. And it looks as if it's all right now. Uh, so uh, uh, let's remind you who we are. Well done, the energy companies. They're full of bright ideas to help their customers. Now they've made power so expensive that for an average house such as this, you can't afford to heat it. So you don't need appliances such as this. But that means you also don't need a fridge because you can keep your groceries cool and fresh without it. The house is cold enough. Well done, chaps. Well done, chaps. Not very well done. They are behaving differently.
it seems to be uh, um, uh, partly uh, provided. And uh, these things do happen. You can't blame them. Um, but uh, we, we have, it means a stuttery old program, doesn't it? It really needs a stuttery old program. And uh, yeah, that, that's... Uh, um, Let's, let's, let's take a look at some of the things that we've done in the past. Uh, and uh, this is uh, going back a couple of years, uh, but uh, some important stuff or interesting stuff. And we, uh, we, we mustn't uh, knock it too much. Um, let, let's see. Uh, some documentaries, I think, yes. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Documentary Hour with me, Jake Ray. We have an array of documentaries for you this hour. First up, we have Item, a Sophie Cook story. In this documentary, you'll find out how Sophie Cook became Sophie Cook. So, stay tuned. Here it is. I took Sophie and I murdered her and I buried her. Um, and that... That nearly killed me. Tories robbing old folk blind, pour the ill and none to kind. Fuel the myth of the strong and stable, but there's no food upon your table. United fighting for what's right. But of the dark into the light We'll raise the red flag, not the blue Fight for the many and not the few I'm not defined by what's between my legs I'm defined by what's in my heart and between my ears and For anyone to think that they know more about my identity than I do myself shows supreme arrogance So, here's all my vulnerabilities now what you can try and hurt me with. I've known that I was transgender since I was about seven years old. At first it started off as a state of confusion, a state of unease. And, and predominantly through my childhood that was it because I didn't have uh, females in the house apart from my mother so I had no one that I could look at and go Actually, I identify more like them, so it was a very male environment. But it wasn't until about 98, 2000 that I actually started to work out what this meant. And at that point, I realised that I had to transition. So I, um, I went to see the doctors and then I started on hormones. And then my partner got pregnant and the plan was that our child would have two mothers. But on the day that my son was born, he had a massive seizure. We nearly lost him, and I remember holding this tiny baby in my hands and thinking, I can't put this child through through the amount of abuse that I'm getting, the amount of pain that I'm getting. Um, so I took Sophie, and I murdered her, and I buried her. A lot of trans people totally delete who they were before. I couldn't do that. And recently I've started looking at Steve pre-transition, and... I get the feeling that I'm looking at pictures of ghosts, not just because these people aren't here anymore, but because in a lot of ways I think they never were. It feels like he was a placeholder waiting for me to be here. Identity is made up of obviously your gender, your sexuality, your, your spiritual outlook on the world, your philosophical outlook on the world, your political outlook. Um, all of these things contribute to who you are. And for most people, they have no idea that there's all these components that make up their identity because they've never had to examine it. I remember sitting there on the bus and looking out the bus window and thinking, should I wake up every day and think, yeah, I'm a woman? I don't do that because the thing is, no one wakes up every day and goes, yeah, I'm a woman. Genetic women don't do that. 
See, his identity was confused and it was a mishmash of things. There was no coherence to it because there was this big component of it that was at 90 degrees to the rest of it. And that just threw everything else out of kilter. Um, it was only when I actually transitioned and came out though that that final jigsaw piece just slotted into place and then, then you could see the whole picture. Uh, and that's been a very interesting realisation to realise that all of the component parts were already there. But the key part that actually tells you what, what the image is was the one that was missing. I went from a lifetime of being suicidal because I wasn't me to then becoming me and losing everyone else. The disappointing, upsetting thing was that at the moment that I actually became me and stopped feeling suicidal because I wasn't, I then started feeling suicidal because I was on my own. Say um, family social events. Steve would be hiding in the corner because he, he was emotionally disconnected from things. I would be the centre of attention. I would be getting involved in everything because I have this love of life and this love of people now that that Steve was never able to have. I, and yet I've been I've been robbed of that. When you're a social person, to be utterly isolated and totally alone can break your heart. It breaks my heart every single day that I'm not with my children. To me, identity is finding who you are and finding your own place in the world. It was a lifelong journey. It was a journey that I started as a kid when I was confused. And it was, it's a journey that I'm still not at the destination, but I'm, I'm at least on the right road now. Raise the red flag, not the blue. Fight for the many and not the few. We'll fight for the many and not the few. Fight for the many and not the few. Influencer and I own a vintage shop in Brighton called Waste Vintage. Uh, it's on Gardner Street. 
guests. I've always been very happy with Liddy's groom. Um, I cannot recommend her enough. Um, we've come back every time and every time he looks amazing. He just comes back all soft and fluffy. <laughs> <laughs> Liddy is the best groomer we've ever had in Brighton. She always listens to what we want. She doesn't take it too short and Stan always loves his groom. I'm, really, I'm planning on coming to the new shop. I'm really excited. I'm excited to see what she does. We have our own groomed in a few different places in Brighton, but Lydia is the one that we found that we absolutely love and we'll always go back to her now. Um, just the customer service. Um, like Lydia is just the best in Brighton. She's so friendly and lovely. Um, she gets it right every time. She always listens to what we want and Stanley's always a very happy boy when he comes back. Oh, I absolutely love the smell of Stanley when he comes home. He smells great and it always lasts as well. She used to use some like, really amazing shampoo because it just smells great for ages afterwards. So I think the prices are completely fair. He gets a really thorough groom and she always goes above and beyond to make sure he looks amazing. Oh, Stanley loves Lydia's dark peaches. They always play together. It's really sweet to see. Thank you, thank you. And Stanley, Stanley says thank you as well. <laughs> Stanley loves his groom. That was fantastic. Now we've seen what makes Sophie Cook, Sophie Cook. We are about to embark on a journey that is Jake and Jack's Follies. It's written, directed and produced by yours truly. Jake and Jack's Follies tells you the story of Mad Jack Fuller. Mad Jack Fuller lived in Brightling, East Sussex. He created some eccentric buildings. Let's find out more about them. I always find it strange how two people can experience and view a place in completely different ways. Jack Fuller was born into money, and at the age of 20, he moved to Brightling in East Sussex after inheriting land and a fortune from his uncle Rose. At the age of 22, Fuller became the Member of Parliament for Southampton. Fuller lost his seat after a vicious row over his support for slavery. This was the time when he began to focus more on his estate and his love of combining art and science. I moved down from Glasgow to Sussex when I was nine years old, and that would be in 2003. I first saw the Follies when my granddad was driving me through Brightling, and I remember looking at them and, and just asking him what these strange buildings were. Jack Fuller was affectionately known as Mad Jack by local residents who did not understand his fascination with useless buildings. A folly is a building with no purpose other than decoration. The first of Jack's six follies was the summer house. Jack was a keen gambler and he entered into a wager that he could see the spire of Dallington Church from his window. Upon realising that he was mistaken, he quickly constructed the sugar loaf to very effectively mimic the church spire. I looked out of my girlfriend's window and, and I saw this strange building in the distance and uh, I asked her, you know, what, what is this strange building? And she replied uh, that it was the sugar loaf. The first time I went, I remember I took my girlfriend there and I uh, gave her a love letter.
The Rotunda Temple was built to hold artwork, most notably paintings commissioned from J.M.W. Turner. Jack was a philanthropist, and during an economic depression, he hired hundreds of local labourers to build a huge wall around his estate. However, the wall did not stop trespassers. You know, we all thought the temple was full of art, and I was a bit shocked to find out that there was none. All I found when I first went in was graffiti left from the Canadian Air Force that was stationed on the estate during the Second World War. The temple is the motif for the internationally renowned Breitling Horse Trials, which brings in competitors and spectators from all walks of life. The Hermit's Watchtower was built so that Jack could survey his land and have views of the sea. The tower was my special place. I used to go there when I was feeling a bit down or, or um, I had to clear my mind. As you go up the stairs, on the right-hand side, my uh, girlfriend's initials are still there. Mine, well, are not there anymore. When I was feeling alone, I would go to the top of the tower, I would lie down, I would stare through the open roof. I'd wait for nightfall, and then I would look at all the stars. Yeah, I wonder what my place on this earth is. Um, why I was here and I was also wonder why the follies are here and you know it, it, it dawned on me that the, the, the follies aligned almost with the stars and it feels like some of them are there to replicate Orion's belt um, others are there to you know to, to be individual stars like the observatory would be Betelgeuse I've heard some people argue that the observatory is not a folly as it serves a purpose, but don't all the follies serve a purpose? They serve our local history, our culture. When I first came to Sussex from Glasgow, I was such an outsider. People had no idea what I was saying, and I had to get something to point me in the, in the right direction. The obelisk dominates the landscape and is the second highest point in Sussex. I remember looking up at the needle and realising that it pierces the vast, uninterrupted sky. Jack Fuller commissioned the pyramid to be his mausoleum 24 years before his death. This immense structure draws attention away from the Thomas A. Beckett church, in whose graveyard it stands.
I've heard that Jack was buried in the pyramid sitting up on his armchair, with a glass of claret and a roast chicken dinner in front of him. The Follies are all focal points, but don't let them fool you. Their place in the landscape belies their size and their distance. In the beginning I was hungry to consume them and I had rushed to each one in turn. But a short distance turned into a mile, a run into a trek. At last I grew to love the surroundings and adopted the Follies as guides rather than destinations. Jack Fuller was respected by many as a squire who at a time of extreme poverty, when soldiers were returning from the Napoleonic War, did what he could to provide employment and prevent revolution. He was ridiculed by others for his views on slavery and his obsession with erecting follies while people were going hungry. Fuller's follies are an important part of my life and have helped me to find my place. I know many people have followed this path before I have, and I love nothing better than bringing new people to experience them and to fall in love like I did. Is that what it is? We've all had one, and many of us would give them for gifts. Many of them would have them on our desks, and many a student had it tucked in his inside pocket. It's a Parker pen, and I have with me right now, and very pleased to uh, uh, Peter Metier, who was responsible for many years, uh, uh, for making sure that we had one of those pens in our pocket. In fact, you did an incredible job in taking a uh, well, it would be a small factory in, in New Haven and turning it into a world beater. No, I think you got some of your facts <laughs> wrong. <laughs> then put us straight. <laughs> well, it was I was at one stage. Uh, at the latter stages of my employment by Parker Penn, I was a director. I was a director of the UK company, and I was also a director of the Parker Penn International, the worldwide company. I was never managing director. Uh, I was uh, had various roles. I was the marketing services director, which looked after advertising and point of sale and things of that sort, and market research, which was a very important part of the business. I was also the personnel director. And I joined the company in 1976. 
when the company was a wholly owned subsidiary of the American Parker Penn Company based in uh, Janesville, Wisconsin and run by the Parker family. Um, and around the world, there were 19 companies in the Parker Group, which did some degree of manufacture or assembly of parts. In other words, they were not merely sales companies. Um, the UK company was by a very large measure, the most um, prosperous, profitable, and prestigious of all the companies in the Parker Group around the world, including the American Parker Pen Company. And the reason for that was that we had, over the years, long before I came into the company, pursued a policy of addressing the top end of the writing instrument market. The little factory at New Haven was in fact there long before it was Parker Penn. I've forgotten exactly what the name of the company was, but it manufactured fountain pens and propelling pencils in New Haven and in Dover. And in the early 70s, the Dover factory was closed down and all concentrations in Britain was concentrated in New Haven. But we were the number one brand in the UK as a sort of quality brand. In the United States, the American company had lost ground to companies like Cross and uh, to a less extent Mont Blanc and Waterman and had concentrated on the Jotter the uh, ubiquitous click top Parker pen that everyone had and used and didn't worry too much if they lost. Whereas here we were producing at the top end, we were producing fountain pens and propelling pencils in solid gold, not gold plate, solid gold. Um, and around the world, uh, they were kept in the safes of the um, local chief executive and used for such things as signing international treaties, company takeovers, uh, that sort of prestige event. Mm. And, the, and the pen was, pen or pens were given to the principal signatories. And indeed we had some kept in our managing director safe uh, and they were made for us. The, ba the barrels and caps uh, were made for us by Johnson Matthew, who were the principal bullion um, users in the UK for all sorts of things. How did they find New Haven? How did, how did who find New Haven? And Parker, Parker International or Parker in America? The Parker family? Well, because there was a pen factory there. And its name, I forget, escapes me. But it was a, a popular sort of school fountain pen. Because don't forget, every, every child at school used a fountain pen. Yeah. That was their principal writing instrument after they graduated from the the stick pen, which went into a, into a hole in the desk. Oh, yeah, that's right. An equal well, I think that's we call right. it. In fact, you had one of your duties as a monitor was to fill up the ink wells every morning. Um, I'm old enough to remember that. And eventually, the Parker family overstretched itself. It bought the very well-known um, employment agency, Manpower. Manpower was also a worldwide company, and in fact, with turnover, I think several times bigger than Parker. But they bit off too much more than they could chew, and they eventually decided that the only way they, as a family, could stay intact was to sell the Parker business. Right. I mean, when you uh, uh, is it a, a case of they didn't know what they were doing with manpower, or that it was just a too big a slice of too big? Yes, too big. Right. Um, uh, and where did you enter the equation? Right. Well, we were we got wind, or were told perhaps officially, that um, that the Parker business was going up for sale. And in, in fact, I can claim to. Have play once a very small part, even if it was only a couple of sentences. I, as a fairly new boy, this was, I think, 19, oh, 
82, uh, then maybe 81, 82. I've lost track, actually. I'd have to look at files. Um, I said, well, you know, we're the most successful bit of the Parker pen. How about we bought it? And my colleagues, this was in a management, we called it the top management group, we called it the policy group. And my colleagues sort of said, well, what do you mean? How do you mean? Well, um, I don't know quite, but I've got a very good contact in the city of London, whom I've known for some years. And he specializes in mergers and takeovers. Do you mind if I go and talk to him? And I did so the following day. And he came down the day after that and met us all. And he said, yes, what you could perhaps aim to do is what's called a leveraged buyout. A leverage manager and buyout. In other words, the management doesn't have to put up very much money. Uh, they have to find some, and the rest comes from major um, lenders who take the majority of the shareholders, and their objective in a management buyout is as soon as feasible, you bring the part, the company to market and, and you you float it and everyone makes a lot of money. Well, we, we did just that. And when our then managing director, Jacques Margry, who was a Frenchman, but he left France in 1940 under shock and sh uh, sh shell and bomb, um, approached the Parker family, they were delighted they were delighted. He had a good standing because the British company was so successful. And they were said, if you can do this, we can think of no one we would rather sell to. So that was getting off to a wonderful start. And then my contact in the city, he started to find people who might come and come on board. Well, the next few weeks were very hectic. I, you know, I almost can't recall them. They're all a bit of a blur. Um, we got perhaps Britain's best known um, management buyout guru, who I think has only very recently died, John Morton, um, who's been in the news for the last 25 years. Um, and he, he came and sort of pulled all the threads together. And so we went ahead, uh, I took out a a mortgage, an extra mortgage on my house uh, to, to raise my share. And I think I bought all the shares were, you know, new sh share structure created. I think I bought 25,000 share, one pound shares and had to raise 25,000 pounds to do so. Uh, and one or two of my fellow directors, um, were allowed to buy more and there were some senior managers who were allowed to also purchase shares um, down to I think about 5,000 shares at the lowest level and for the managing director I think he bought 50,000 shares or put out the money to provide 50,000 shares and of course there were whirlwind trips all over the world to tell all these 19 subsidiaries um, what was going on uh, and people were coming catching planes and coming to London and down to New Haven to say you know what's going to happen to me and all the usual all the usual things however it went ahead and I can't remember again the date I think probably 1983 we became the nominal chief ex chief executive and other directors are now of Parker Penn international and again quite a lot of trips made it bind us as individuals to different countries i went to australia i remember and to japan um and i also companies in europe but we had a german company in baden baden um uh, to, and in france where we had a factory so we all scooted around the world telling people yes your job is secure and this is how it works and you know we'll have a meeting soon to um to uh you know 
tell you where you are. Right, right. But I mean, you, you, you actually you turned it into a very, very important part of New Haven, didn't you? Well, it was already an important part of New Haven because we were the largest manufacturer of writing instruments in the UK and that we continue to do. We, we did edge up our export business to, to a quite a number of markets, but that wasn't a significant thing. New Haven more or less stayed where it was. The significant things were that within a very short time, we closed down the American parent company and parent factory completely. We closed the American factory. It was desperately inefficient. It was poorly equipped compared to the British factory. Uh, it was making a, a very narrow product range of the cheaper end of the range. And they were the largest single manufacturing employer in Janesville, Wisconsin, and we closed it. We had enormous help from big law firms like Clifford Chance and, uh, you know, all, all the major players in the merger mm. takeover financial world. It was a it was a tremendous maelstrom. I guess the, the, the limeys were not very popular in, uh, in the States at that particular stage. Uh, not at that time. No. <laughs> but the thing was, the group was loss making. And how could we turn it around? Well, we had a brilliant finance director who'd been with the company more years than me, but uh, he was actually not even a chartered accountant. I think he was a certified accountant, which means that he'd originally trained to be in local government as, a, as an accountant. But he had, a, he had a brilliant approach, and he did three things that I can recall. Firstly, he ordered every solid gold pen that was held in a subsidiary company, and uh, told you there were 19 of them around the world, to be immediately air, um, by express mail sent to the UK. And within a matter of days, we had got these pens back, we'd taken the caps and the barrels off, we'd sent them to Johnson Matthey, they melted them down, and we got, <laughs> at, the, at that time, we're talking about, this is a lot, a lot of money, something like four million pounds. Yeah. But how did you identify where these pens were? Oh, we knew, they were all in there you know, stock records and so on. The next thing we did was to say, you must immediately increase the gross margin of which you sold every product. So if you were selling products cheaply in order to try and get market share, uh, -uh that's no good. Forget market share, gross margin. And he set 50% as the gross margin you must aim for. And the third thing he did was to introduce, and this is in the days of fax, not of computers, every single day, every subsidiary around the world had to report its daily sales. Mm. Daily sales, every day. And believe it or not, by that simple pressure, in other words, reducing the high value stock um, and daily reporting, increasing gross margins. The business which was been severely loss taking, well, loss making world well, well, became into profit. And once that profit looked secure, then of course our owners said, right, now we must take the cup to, to market. And this I, again, I think it's 1987. We went, through, we decided that we would um, go to market, float the company as a public company uh, on the London Stock Exchange on a certain day in October 1987. My mind escapes me whether it was a Monday or a Wednesday. But the important thing is, I mean, everything was put into place. Um, we, each manager who had a share of the uh, uh, um, shares, like me, we were permitted to sell up to 25% of our holding. And at the best estimates of um, 
what the price would well, well they would name a, a launch price a day or two before and what the premium would go for very quickly which they thought it would i mean in other words the market would within 24 hours you want to snap it up everything they get a hold of and that would push the stock market price up well i think i stood to make about 1.2 million or something like that um on the, on their estimates mm -hmm. Not a bad day at the office. No, uh, for my twenty-five thousand pound investment. Yes, yes. And I'd also done and the risk. Hmm? And the risk. The risk. Yes. Of negligible we felt. Negligible. You were terribly confident about the flotation. Absolutely. And it turned out to be Black Monday. <laughs> the famous Black Monday in nineteen eighty three. Right. Always Black Wednesday. But it's the fact when the stock market collapsed in a single day. And we had to pull the flotation at sort of eight o'clock that morning and stopped it. And we'd already registered it as a PLC because you did that first. <laughs> and that got cancelled within a few days. So a lot of fees involved, of course, huge amount of money went out of it. Yes. And it had to be pulled. And what to do? Well, after a good deal of uh, hemming and hawing, um, it was decided by our, the major shareholders, which is all the people who pride up of, of this outside money, that we should uh, go for a private sale. And the person who came up was Mr. Rubin, the famous Rubin family. They're still around. Um, two sons, I think old man Rubin is still alive, but two sons um, are very well known in the sometimes rich list every year they owned at the time reebok and they owned a famous brand of um oh revelation for um luggage but they own reebok as well he was a, he came obviously we had him to lunch in the director's dining room uh, i took uh, i didn't like him nobody liked him <laughs> <laughs> um, nobody has liked him apparently. I mean, there's a girl in there's a girl in Lewis, whom I know very well, a Chinese girl. Her husband is the pilot of the Rubens private aircraft. Um, he was a pilot for Buffet, uh, Warren Buffet, and uh, she acts as the air hostess. Um, but it's the two sons that fly mostly now. Well. Uh, there were still a lot of people coming and going. Um, the manager director and the um, uh, finance director were, I think, possibly in Chicago when I, as the most senior sort of resident director, was approached by the Financial Times to, for a statement and you know the way they do it you, yeah. now or never sort of in the yeah. next five minutes about n nothing about the rubens had come made public nothing about it what was going on made public and i said what i thought was the right thing to say and it got quoted on the front page of the financial times the management of the company are concentrating on beating the comp competition, increasing market share and increasing profits and are not giving any real thought to the sale of the company. And we believe that proceeding as we are as a private company is in our best interests. Now, I said that. Actually, I did. Yeah, I said it because I believed it. I don't know what happened. I believe strongly. I didn't want to sell the Rubens, but I also thought it protected the secrecy of what was going on. Unfortunately, Mr. Rubin misconstrued or read between the lines and phoned the manager director and said, I'll get him out. I won't have him. Right. And so to cut the long story short, I was got out. Oh, yes. Yeah. And my shareholding was um, bought back at valuation at the time now the company was now profitable uh -huh. so the one pound shares were 
worth yes. considerably more than one pound. So I did get quite a lot of money, enough to rebuild the garden house. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I didn't anywhere get what I would have got if we'd floated. And secondly, oh, I was allowed to keep 1,000 pounds worth of shares, 1,000 shares of one pound. The company in the end, Reuben pulled out at five o'clock on the day, on the day that it was due to be signed at six o'clock in the evening the purchase he pulled out and a few months later parker pen was sold to the gillette company which gillette owned um papermate and subsequently waterman and the companies were all rolled up into one and production was closed at new haven and moved to our french factory in france oh no moved to the waterman factory in france and so that's what that's what happened. Oh, it's a saga, a city saga. I've, and yeah. Incidentally, I didn't come prepared for any of this conversation, and so a lot of it is just memory. Yeah, um, it doesn't matter. It's fascinating. And, and uh, I, I uh, destroyed all my files before them. <laughs> um, um, but incidentally, before they were destroyed, <laughs> and I'll say this, my present wife, um, she went through them before they were destroyed, my first wife having died, um, and she said, I think he was right to sack you. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's take it from there. Yeah. Let's, let's, go, let's go to uh, um, the uh, uh, Peter Metier story. Where did it all begin? Well, I was born in uh, uh, South Sea. Uh, both my father and my grandfather were in the Navy, uh, lower deck, uh, but senior lower deck. Um, eventually, we ended up, well, cut a loss, long story, very short. My father left the Navy, uh, ostensibly because of uh, hearing loss due to gunfire. Um, and uh, at the time when the Navy was desperately really getting rid of everyone it possibly could, about 1929 or 30. And um, he joined the Hoover Company when it was an embryo company when they used to unpack the parts of Hoover's and put them together uh, in a sort of shed in Southampton or somewhere, um, and eventually rose to a, a, a quite a senior sales management level. So that in 1940, when the Blitz sort of began, just on the early days of the Blitz, anyone who's had been in Parker Pen, oh, sorry, Hoover Limited, for 10 years or more, and who were limited had just built that wonderful, wonderful building on Western Avenue, which thank God didn't get pulled down like the Firestone building. It's still a wonderful facade. Behind it is the Tesco. Um, who had been with the company 10 years or more, or was a certain level of, of seniority, they could send their child or children to America, to the Hoover Company, to shelter during the war. And that's what happened to me I went to the United States in September 1940, and I came back on an aircraft carrier uh, yeah. in May 1945, having had um, you know, an American childhood and growing up in a middle-class American family, you know, sort of two-car family sort of thing. Um, and, um, well, to put it simply, I joined the got on board this aircraft carrier with about another dozen or so other kids. Incidentally, 80 of us went to America uh, and went up the entire state building, which is only just opened uh, <laughs> in September 1940. And um, uh, I got on board the aircraft carrier, and I remember uh, there was a commander. But by the time I got off in Greenock 10 days later, there was a commander. In other words, I lost my American accent, very, very quickly. <laughs> I still is there for certain words. I think I say theater. <laughs> than, yes. Yeah. Uh, and since then, I've had a, uh, I went, uh, did my national service in the Navy. Um, yeah. I was a midshipman. I had quite a lot to do with Duke of Edinburgh. Um, I beat him in a sailing race and he beat me in a rowing race. Um, and uh, I was always, I was a sort of go-between between, between our commanding officer and him, because we were in the same flotilla uh, in adjacent ships. Um, you know, went to various places like um, Athens and 
mum Reese in Turkey and Can, and he was always there next door to us. Um, so I was very, very pleased. Oh, yes, and I auditioned for his polo team in Malta, and thank goodness didn't get selected <laughs> because my pay was seven and sixpence a day, and I don't think I could have kept up to my end. But I, my father had, you could send anything to forces overseas by post free. And I hastily uh, sent a telegram playing, please send my riding boots, which I had, because I'd, I'd ridden a lot as a teenager at school. I was at school, by the way, in, after America. I was mostly school in Germany, because my father was in the Army of Occupation. And I was British school there, mm. where, incidentally, I also met the person who's now my second wife. <laughs> we were both at the same school in 1947. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, um, my father posted out my riding boots, complete with their solid wooden trees. Ah, weighed a ton, weighed a ton. <laughs> and after I left um, the Navy of National Service, two years, I went to Cambridge, Gonville and Keys, read history, nearly went to be a schoolmaster, but instead joined industry. And spent so the whole of my working life until I joined Parker Finn, which indeed I considered I was in industry, in uh, firstly the metal box company, which was then had 36 factories around Britain, um, making every tin can that ever was, um, including things like Christmas gift boxes and so on. And oh, they also printed banknotes and good as well. And then the steel company of Wales. Uh, and then I was 15 years in management consultancy, and Parker Penn was my one of my main clients, so I joined them. Uh, just to identify who we are, Peter, then we'll come back and have a, a bit more of a chat, if we may. Yep, there we go. I walk past that two or three times a week. I'm sure there are quite a lot of inaccuracies in my Parker account because you know, I didn't didn't have any notes or anything with me. And I, yeah, well, I, I, I doubt whether he was going to pick your part. Uh, I mean, it's a fascinating story. It's nearly uh, 50 and, years. Uh, uh, of course, I can remember uh, when I first came to Lewis, which would be 1990, uh, and almost the first thing that uh, people said is, uh, 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 gosh, yes, you know, uh, uh, Parker Penns is in, in New Haven. I mean, it, it was a name to conjure with. Um, and not just because most of us carried one in our pocket, I think. Right. Well, at a peak... I think after we transferred a lot of production that had been in the United States, we brought it here to the UK initially. We went on a three um, shift working, never done it before. I did, by the way, I did some marvelous things at Parker in one respect. We, because we were very profitable, at my instigation and worked it through, everyone in the company factory workers which were the main element office workers and all the lower levels of management were an absolutely identical pay system and the identical number of hours work a week and everyone was on health insurance booper a local surgeon told me said my god when you did that we had about 500 varicose veins <laughs> down in Brighton in the next couple of years because a lot of the work was standing. At the peak on the three six shift system, we employed 1,200 people in New Haven. Normally, it was about 750 to 800. So we were the major employer. All right. Uh, now, what about uh, uh, Peter Metier, uh, uh, the man of the community? Uh, what sort of things did you get involved in in Lewis uh, during your time here? Well, I suppose the major thing was because no, there were two or three things. Firstly, with this park of shares that I had, the 15,000 initially, under this apparent newfound wealth, was my wife felt uncomfortable about it. And so, two and a half thousand shares were put into. A charitable trust called the Meteor Charitable Trust. Well, because it couldn't be taken over, it was a charitable trust, 
because it qualified for all the tax breaks under the sun, because Gillette paid those shares at the same rate as the others, those £2,500 one pound shares became something in the order of three hundred thousand pounds and you'll find everything from the odd cast uh, seat around lewis um you know park bench and so on mm -hmm. to many many other things um we gave away over the next um 10 years or so a bit longer we gave away in total to world national but principally local uh, charities and events um four hundred thousand pounds with the collapse of the financial world in the 2009 or whenever it was the share the amount of the capital left in uh, the charity of trust was down to about 220 230 pounds and we approached the charity commissioners and said um, you know are we allowed to give away the capital and they said yes and so you'll find that a third of the cost of the link later pavilion was provided by us all right this is why the main room upstairs is called the meteor room mm -hmm. how how we happen to draw up uh, become quite chatty and friendly over the next three or four years with dennis healy got to know really reasonably right. well he lived just down the road didn't he yeah no. and he was also uh, on the uh, initial committee of the link later pavilion and part of our price of giving a quarter of a million or thereabouts was that the pavilion should be named the link later pavilion because we again a close personal friend um ex-director of shell and in a sense over the centuries probably lewis's largest single practical benefactor because he stopped the inner relief road and he ensured the bypass got built and the tunnel uh -huh. right. you know about him uh, I hope. It, 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 it not specifically um oh gosh well it, it's uh, uh i don't know the detail um it's uh he lived he lived up the top of the high street uh -huh. No, we lived in Southover initially, in the Gables, the big right, house right. In the, facing the church. Yeah. The um, what, what I uh, was uh, going to say to you is, uh, believe it or not, uh, from uh, uh, this uh, bar in a, a, a very famous hotel, uh, but in a small town, uh, our reach is enormous. We've got somebody from Patagonia who regularly... Right. <laughs> so would you explain what the Lake Later Pavilion is? Well, oh, it's it's um on the railway wildlife uh, center it's an octagonal built building designed by rich roger beasley who also designed my present house there's and those um and it's it's a center for all sorts of things uh, that's all i can say um or everything from school parties to um people with learning difficulties are based there now you asked me about me though the other two things I did, I was chairman of the governors of the Lewis Priory School for about seven years during the history controversy uh, and the rebuilding of the school, both of which I was very deeply involved in. And I was chairman of the Friends of Lewis for about eight years. Uh -huh. Now, uh, uh, all right, let, let's go back just very briefly, the, the Little uh, Pavilion. The thing that uh, astonished me was the first time I was in it is uh, there is a, a live beehive in there. It isn't anymore. Has it gone? Yes, it, it's gone. Yeah, but 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 the environment was something that was very very much uh, in in your mind when you had that built. I didn't have it built. I helped pay for it well, being built. Um, it was a, I mean there were a host of organisations and people who were uh, who were behind it. I'm sure they get due credit. But I mean, well, I'm, I'm speaking want... to you, and I I I, I want people to realise because uh, one of the things. Uh, uh, Peter, in, in the uh, in the media industry, we say, uh, uh, tell them, remind them that you told them, and remind them that you reminded them, because people forget within five minutes of what they've been told. Right. Uh, uh, so I, I think it's important this morning, uh, because uh, uh, people to be reminded of the very significant part that you played in uh, the, the uh, social 
uh, background of uh, of Lewis and uh, and your your role in it. Well, I am very proud of the charitable trust. I mean, we we were supporting things like oh the, a play group that needed a hundred pounds, you know, um, for, for bits for the play group. The, the the passing on thing that goes, you know, at the end of the uh, school year. Oh, uh, Patina. Patina. Yeah. Well, we, we provide the initial money for Patina, the initial money. Um, the first step, skate park, uh, we provided most of the cost of the first skate park, not the second one, which is out of this world, but the initial one. Um, we backed a lot of things that Ruth O'Keefe was keen on. Oh, well, if you... Think of South Overgrange Gardens. The there's a lovely metal fence all along there. In fact, it was chain link fencing because the metal fence had been taken down and melted down for Spitfires. You remember that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, we paid for the, the complete refer, rebuilding of that wall, right, and that fence. Um, I think I remember end, it being rebuilt yeah. from one end to the other. That was charitable trust. That was one incidentally that was the charity commissioners were not that keen on although our terms of reference were the, the environment and well-being of lewis you know things like that but they they the charity commission didn't exactly wrap us over the knuckles but said hey you know that's not for the relief of poverty and, and so <laughs> on but lots and lots of i mean oh lots of things we actually then got the uh, the terms of the of our charitable trust tweaked to enable us to do things like that. Um, oh, the first round of these now 70 or 80 plaques on the wall in Lewis, we paid for a lot of those. Um, oh, and so it went on. But we also, I mean, <laughs> I did all the admin for the first couple of years myself and re replied solemnly typed all the reply letters it didn't even use standard letters but we did it we did draw except for in uh, international problems i mean we gave enough money to unicef that my wife and i got taken to unicef's distribution depot in copenhagen as a, as a special trip uh we did enough for action aid in nepal to be invited to st james's palace and shake hands with uh, prince charles uh, Prince Charles then was because he was a sponsor of Action Aid. I visited Action Aid projects in Nepal. We did incidentally make a point of all the local things wherever possible, either before we gave him the money to go and look, and we, that means either my wife or I, uh, oh, and Peter Linklater was a trustee, um, we did either go and see what they were doing to see whether it was a good idea, uh, or after we'd given the money to so see what they were doing with it. Oh, I tell you, remember right at the very bottom of the town there was that sort of cafe. It was the old public loo. Yes. And we helped uh, uh, convert it. Converted. Yes, yes, yes. Things like that. Yeah. Things like that. Yeah. No, but, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm tending to say that anything that Peter Metier uh, touches turns to gold. No, because you, uh, you mentioned that you were involved with Priory School. And uh, that, that will touch a large number of Louisians, uh, but also the number of people that we have in here uh, to be interviewed and let us know what they're doing and so on and so forth. Uh, when they're talking about it, it's a lot of them went to Priory School. Uh, so uh, I, hope what, what you, I hope you don't get Piers Morgan in. Ha, ha, ha. I think that he might think that we're small potatoes. <laughs> no, no, he... he um... I think he was captain of cricket at, uh, at uh, Priory. He's a very good cricketer, my dad. Was he? Mm, he yes. Was. He he had every year he hosts an old England team to play Newick because that's where. He oh, lived. that's right. Yes, yes. His, his cricket match is, is famous, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. yeah. Uh, it, it's just as an aside. Uh, do you know the other famous cricket match that takes place here each year? What's that? It's the um, uh, Invalids. Who play in Rodnell, and they are the cricket team in England. Their England, written oh, by McDonald. Oh right, <laughs> and that that goes on to this day. Oh right. <laughs> but anyway, that, I, I don't want to divert because uh, um, I, I'm always very interested in in uh, uh, education, 
Well, uh, and uh, it, it, you, you didn't see, seem to hint because this is long before my time here uh, that, uh, uh, that, that there was a sort of uh, metamorphosis of uh, a priory. It, it went from something perhaps ordinary to something quite special. Oh no, that nothing. Oh, I mean, it would take a long time to to sort out my head about priory. Except priory started off on the best foot possible. It was the merger under Boris Ford, who was professor of education at Sussex and was a driver of the comprehensive movement nationally, I think. I think he was sort of played a national role. But Priory was a merger of Lewis Grammar School for Boys, Lewis Grammar School for Girls, and the secondary modern school in Mountfield Road. Well, what do you think the balance of talent, skills, and education was of that institution. Two-thirds a grammar school, one-third a comprehensive. No. Uh, no, sorry, a secondary model. So Priory started off with a huge advantage over most comprehensive schools. Um, whether how much of that is retained, I don't know. But I certainly, even when I was a governor and then chairman of the governors, but I was chairman of the governors for a particular reason at a particular time and the existing governor Delia Venables um, felt that uh, certain things about her background didn't deal didn't f equip her as someone from the world of business if I could be called that uh, for what was looming on the horizon and um, well there's a long that would make at least another broadcast as long as this <laughs> um and it well became, you're welcome back any time i became yeah. known nationally as the lewis history controversy with questions in the house of lords lord skodelsky um being a local uh, challenger um oh it appeared in the black papers you name it um that was one and two was the counties deciding to delay the rebuilding and extension of the school, which, um, let us say, I did my best to overturn that decision. And indeed, it was overturned. And we got the school built on time. Well, I have to say uh, <laughs> that uh, it is. Uh, Anybody that I speak to who went to primary school always have a, a great sense of pride. Yes. Uh, uh, and uh, I think that, um, I mean, uh, I was lucky. Uh, I, I went to a school that's very similar. But uh, it, it's not always that pupils remember their school fondly. Uh, but I, I, almost without question, if somebody says that they've been to priory, uh, they say it with that, that great sense as I went to a special school. Well, certainly. Uh, my children were partly educated in Brighton and elsewhere for a variety of reasons, but they all spent uh, their six form years at the, at the Priory, and indeed, at least one of my children spent all, all their secondary uh, years at the Priory. Um, you now have, incidentally, four very high flying young women from the Priory. You know about them? No, yeah, tell us. Well, Emma Tucker. Oh, yes, of course. She's just yes. been appointed to the Washington Post. Yes, and indeed. Was, and in fact, she was um, the Sunday Times. Yes, Stuart Dolby has asked her to appear on this program. Oh, well, uh, and yeah. her father, Nick, um, uh, and her mother, um, I see her. Nick rides his bike still up the high street. He runs the, um, the um, Nicholas Young Society, the Music Society. And he was uh, uh, Don at uh, Sussex. Then in the same year, or plus or minus one year, uh, there's Emma Tucker, Lucy Atkins, where you'll see her name uh, on reviews in The Spectator, right. and in The Times, in The Sunday Times. She's a novelist in her own right, uh, well regarded. She's also, I think, now professor of English at um, one of the, the Ivy League um, universities in America. Um, that's number two. Annabelle Abs, her mother, walks past here quite often. 
she's a novelist, quite successful. Um, and the last one is Miriam Darlington, whose nature notes appear in the Times every four weeks. I always say, and and actually, all, there is hidden four, Lewis. Uh, uh, as a lot of people don't realize uh, when they pass them in the streets, just uh, what interesting, successful, and even powerful people we have uh, in this town. But those four girls uh, are all either in the same year or one year plus or minus. With what well, one of my children was at the same time as me. Yes, so this, you, you, you turn out a generation. Well, amazing, <laughs> amazing. And Nick Tucker, uh, quite rightly, <coughs> grumbles that the school doesn't make anything of that fact. That there, you know, these are four successful yes, literary yes. figures. Miriam Darlington also wrote, wrote a very well-liked book, which is always mentioned in the Times, called Owls. And it's the sort of... She writes beautifully, actually. Nice girl. And her mother, uh, Shirley Darlington, again, walks past here. Well... There we are, mm. famous, famous oh. hotel and lots of famous people. Uh, so those people who are watching in Patagonia uh, take notes. <laughs> Peter, uh, you, you, you... I'll tell you another famous person who spent a day in Lewis and came to St. Michael's Church, John Betjeman. Oh, did he? Yeah. Uh, 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 Summoned by bells, yes. Uh, <laughs> Totted up the aisle. <laughs> and of course, yes. before... And of course, you, you were a reader at, uh, at St. Michael's for a number of years. Yes, I did. Yeah. And of course, you know, we had, of course, the former Bishop of Johannesburg. Right. When he was kicked out by the. Ah, right. Uh, the, what was his name? Um, he was the rector of, of it, St. Michael's. No, I didn't know that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, you know, public name. Yeah. Right. Uh, Peter, uh, it's been fascinating. Uh, um, uh, I'm going to let you go because uh, I'm sure your bottom is getting sore sitting in that. Yeah. But I think that you've opened up a real, real can of worms. Uh, I, I'm, I'm very proud to be uh, part of Lewis. And uh, I, I like to think that this uh, very small but uh, perhaps influential uh, television operation is able to uh, put out a lot of information about the town and about the people. Uh, so I would like you to, uh, perhaps in a week or two, um, uh, is to come back and uh, tell us some more about uh, the, the things that are happening in Lewis, that have happened in Lewis, uh, because uh, it, it's all very well, and I, I'm guilty of it, is uh, at, at 1264 uh, uh, and, uh, um, and uh, November the 5th are the two dates that kicked around. But there is so much more to this town, so much more, and a lot of it in modern history. Uh, and uh, I think that we should be aware of it and we should know about it, because well, it's a matter of pride. It, today... Uh, no, no, today, this week, uh, is exactly 64 years since I moved into Lewis. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you've been here a bit longer than me. <laughs> Jan January 59. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, oh, It's been fun. The, uh, uh, very welcome back because uh, you've opened my eyes uh, a lot. I thought I knew a lot about Lewis, uh, and you've uh, covered just about everything that I didn't. Uh, so... Uh, please do return in a week or two's time, if you don't mind, and uh, we'll talk some more. Well, as I say, when people ask, how are you? And I have to give that standard answer for a 91-year-old. As far as I know, <laughs> as far as I know. Well, uh... Right. Time to go and do some other things. Okay. Give us back our town beer wine so thank you for joining us hey ellie ellie come on give us a kiss come on <laughs> do admire the hanging gardens of babylon on the way they can't even cut that back properly. hello 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 at last i've caught you asleep you did hold up a bible upside down but you held it up it is a massive, massive ball of uselessness. Oh, you can't say that. Way 
is it my romances all go wrong? Ellie was the first girl her mother thought me twee. She sent a big invitation with an RSVP. It is wonderful to end a day like this, but I am completely sober and articulate, and I'm surrounded by people who cannot put two words together. You said end the day like this. Isn't this the morning programme or something? Uh, yes. Okay. <laughs> You're ending it already? Yeah, well, you've been drinking all day. All day? It's all right then. <laughs> it is the morning programme, you know. Well, you will be drinking all day. Oh, God, after this I will. <laughs> We've learned so much on this epic journey. We've learned what makes Lewis Lewis and what it's had to deal with in the past. We've learned... What else did we learn? I'm Mark Lansman. Diddle bib. Pray for me. Goodbye. Mirador TV. Thank you very much. Bye bye. And welcome to Mirador Television. We are the biggest little TV in the world, based in Lewis, East Sussex, in England. Our aim is to entertain and to spice things up a little. We will also keep an eye on the local politics. Because, let's face it, someone has to. Our programmes range from stories about the local people to stories about people from all the way across the pond. Brought to you by our wonderful colleagues in New York. So why not sit back, relax with your favourite cuppa, or maybe your favourite tipple, and enjoy. This is Mirador Television. For some peculiar reason, government seems to think that bigger is better. It doesn't matter. You can look at disasters around the world. <laughs> if you want a really good example of bigger is not better, look at the old Soviet Union, which imploded. Huge, huge, huge. But the thought that we can do more, get more effective use of institutions, be they government or private, because they are bigger, seems to have settled so solidly in the minds of the bureaucrats that they can't actually mix and match. Of course, some things need to be big. Of course, some things need to have the capacity to handle international matters. But that is not true of local government. And trying to make local things, whether it's the local NHS or whether it's the local government, bigger because they think it'll be better, seems not to have been examined in any way. Lewis, this small town, merged its administration with Eastbourne. The result has been chaos, complete chaos. The accounts are all over the place. The politicians don't know who they're looking at when they go to scrutiny. The chief executive seems to favor Eastbourne because that's where he's located. All in all, bigger most certainly has not been better. And I personally am asking people to think about clawing back Lewis from this merger, which made no sense in the first place, and certainly is not working. But now it's the NHS's turn. Oh gosh, yes, another monolithic government organization. They want to have a super surgery. In fact, they're going to have a super surgery in Lewis. All the little surgeries and the dentists 
and all the little organizations that have to do with medicine and our health are going to be under one roof. Disaster. It already is disaster. Until recently, I could go to my surgery and I could talk to the ladies, delightful ladies, I may say, behind the reception desk and explain my problem. I could also insist that I saw my dedicated doctor, which the NHS bravely said each person over 65 can have a dedicated doctor. I've got one, and by golly, is she a cracker. She is really, really very good. And I want to stay with her. But when I talk to people now, they have no idea, A, that that directive is in place, or B, that I should be able to have the same doctor time after time after time. They don't know because they don't know me. They don't know me because now they are part of this huge, sprawling organization. The building yet to be built, incidentally, but the organizers can't wait, and so they've gone ahead and done it, which is now making the NHS bigger but my golly, if anybody can argue that it's better, then I'd like to hear the argument. But these sort of things are beginning to happen also when it comes to media. Now, media has a special problem. Because of the internet, traditional media has shrunk. It has difficulty looking after local communities. So, media gets bigger, local people get less service. And now it appears that according to Harvard University, that as this happens and as media shrinks, so the services provided by the local government get worse. And not only that, to cap it all, as a badge of honor, the council tax rises. Well, that's very true of this particular district. Lewis district. But in checking with colleagues around the country, it's true wherever you go. Reform? Not bloody likely. The only suggestion is that this situation can be resolved by us getting even bigger. Ah, I have no idea who my county council councillors are or what they do, even though they're located in my hometown. Bigger is better. Come on, pull the other one. It's about time that we said, let's start to look at micro. Micro pubs doing very well, thank you. Because the big boys couldn't satisfy the needs of the punter, the drinker. That was reform. <laughs> Pushed on the big breweries. And let me say, I see Harvey's as really a microbrewery. They're not one of the great big pompous chains that tell us what we should drink and where we should drink it and, and buy public houses and, and then put impossible conditions on the tenants. No, I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about these huge conglomerates who actually, whether it's media or whether it's pubs, seem to think that bigger is better. Well, take a second look. Let's examine whether bigger is better. And if bigger turns out not to be better, then let's have reform going in the opposite direction. Let us get Lewis to be able to determine its own destiny. That is the democratic way. That is the right way. And not the way that the bureaucrats are doing it at the moment. Which, as Mikhail Gorbachev said, one of the great mysteries of his political and public life is why Western European politicians are rushing to recreate the old Soviet Union. I made that charge against the EU. I hope I don't have to make it against my own country, against the UK. Bigger is better, but remember, you're watching television that is the biggest little TV in the world. Welcome to it. Keith Hayes, see you later. boiled or fried. I don't know who he thinks he's kidding. He only ever has oysters and champagne. And I have to work with him.
Well, good morning. Uh, it's Keith Hayes at Priory Park in Lewis, standing or sitting by Jenry, our mascot, and indeed a very important person in history. And that's why I thought I would find any here. I'm very pleased that any Verrill is joining me for Break an Egg, our new morning program. And uh, she is, uh, she's all right, really. It's like wind in the willows. They say that the squirrels are all right and the rabbits are all right, uh, but we chaps, we're okay. Oh, dear. Don't suppose you've got anything nice to say about me, have you? What am I supposed to say to that? Although, you did mention an important person. I thought you were talking about me. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Thank yeah, you. I mean, she, she's a right little nag, you know. I mean, she gets out of me for the slightest thing. Did you bring a pen? Oh, yes, I brought a pen. Well, it's a good job you remember because you know you have to work. I have to work with this woman day in day out. I mean, can you imagine? No wonder it's nothing to do with age that I'm bald and looking as old as I do. Hmm. Well, here I am to bring some youth into this program. <laughs> and if you did things the right the first time, I wouldn't have to nag you, you know. <laughs> We're not doing it for fun, even though you'd like to believe so, wouldn't you? <laughs> Listen to it. Well, the reason that I was talking about nagging is that Gundrada, who is the wife of Bill Warren, who was the first Lord of Lewis after the Norman Conquest in 1066, insisted that this, this priory should be built. And it was built in 1079. And a lot of it is still standing, despite the vandalism of Henry VIII, 400 years later, in fact. But uh, uh, the, the fact is, she nagged poor old uh, uh, William the Conqueror and her husband Bill to death just to get it built. Nag, 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 typical woman. Yes, and then what happened? The priory was built. We wouldn't no. have a priory to sit at right now. I'll give you that. Well, there you go. I right. know I'm right. I bet you there's more, more people wanting to spend the money better away, just the way they do today. I'm sorry, what? <laughs> oh, she hasn't been listening. Whenever well, the government says he's going to spend two billion or so, it's always somebody that says, oh, they could have been better spent on. Mm-hmm. Well, Mm -hmm. They argue like you and I. You and politics. Blooming heck. <laughs> you do get boring sometimes. Yes, I suppose so, but then we always have to have a little touch of politics, particularly at this hour of the morning when we're talking to the people of Lewis. What and a way to wake up. Oh, yes, wake up to listening. If this is not going to wake you up. Politics. <laughs> 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 but we do have, uh, we can get off politics now, because we do have uh, uh, Stephen Catlin, uh, who is to be the mayor of Lewis. Lewis Town, that is, not Lewis District Council, next year. Uh, and he has an insight into the council, and he'll be giving us uh, a little bit of more depth. So let's talk about something else. We have this morning a little bit on food. Mmm, yummy. Just the thing I like to talk about. <laughs> Anytime I've been to a restaurant, I never approves of anything I order. Yeah, whatever. Because all you want to eat is blowing watery stuff. <laughs> ah, I wouldn't be seen within a mile of water. You see how well she knows me. Just put a glass of water in front of me and I faint. <laughs> I meant oysters, okay? I'm not posh enough to know these things. <laughs> and I don't like them. Oh, listen to her. I'm posh enough to know what an oyster is. I'm not is. rich enough to like oysters. <laughs> I have to say, I was with her when she tried her first oyster. Ooh, <laughs> Talk I, about comedy. <laughs> I bet that wasn't a pretty sight. <laughs> well, I am. She's right. I am an oysters and champagne man. And uh, I, I, I just love oysters. And when I lived in Northern Ireland, we were just around the corner from uh, a, a company which is now out of business and as Q and Oysters. Uh, so I was able to go and get uh, a dozen or so a day. But it's always said that oysters. Uh, uh, oh, don't say it. No, 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 no. Don't, 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 don't say it. But I've got to. But, 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 but no, oh no, it's too early for that. <laughs> what eating oysters? 
No, it's too early to listen to what you wanted to say. <laughs> the owner was interviewed by uh, um, a, a friend of mine who was the chief photographer of the Daily Mirror, Cyril Kane, who was a, a, known as the commander of a great character. And Cyril went down there and he said to uh, Jasper Parsons, who was the man who ran the uh, oystery, if that's what we call it, a fishery, and he said, is there any truth, uh, uh, Jasper, uh, that in the saying that uh, oysters make you feel frankly randy? And uh, Jasper said, no, 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 not at all, not at all, Cyril. He said, uh, uh, there's no truth to it whatsoever. And Cyril said, are you married, Jasper? He said, yes. He said, how many children do you have? Seventeen. <laughs> Oh, you don't find that funny. Well, feel better now. Oh, yes. Now that you mentioned your favourite topic. <laughs> I must say it's never done that for me, but the champagne, the little bubbles get up my nose and I just love it. How about you? Mm, champagne is good, but a Bloody Mary is even better. Ah, now tell us about the Bloody Mary. Hmm, who doesn't know a Bloody Mary? First of all, the name, very good name. Some tomato juice, some vodka. The more the better, some horseradish and some black pepper and maybe a little bit of sherry in there, just for the twist. Sounds good, but some people, mm. Canadians particularly, say that they like tomato juice. Ever tried that? Well, you sort of maybe try it once. Not for me, no. How about V8, the vegetable juice? Mm -mm. No? No. <laughs> No pleasing some people. A Bloody Mary it is, made in the original style. Mm. The original Bloody Mary. Yummy. Okay, well, it, it, uh, we, we've had a good natter uh, to start off the programme this morning. Uh, I think that Annie said that she wanted her eggs poached. I will have mine fried. And uh, so we're going to go away for a, a few minutes uh, to give Stephen and one or two others a chance to butt in on this programme, uh, both about food, politics, architecture, you name it, we've got a whole potpourri coming up. Tooth it. Goodbye. Well, uh, <clears throat> yeah, there we go. Uh, Annie Beryl, who's now uh, pursuing a career in law. My goodness me, I have to watch my T's and Q's with that. Uh, I'm sure uh, that there's so much that goes on that's politically not correct on this program. Uh, but one of the things that uh, I, we are proud of is we are not owned by uh, any big interests. Uh, we are not uh, part of any big organization that tells us what we can do and what we can't do. And uh, as a consequence, we do have a lot of uh, alternative um, uh, um, programs and thoughts. Uh, and uh, with any luck at all, I I'm uh, uh, just going to see if I can uh, now d d find uh, uh, one of those um, dissidents, uh, if you like, or at least a different view, um, uh, because it's, um, it's important uh, that we absolutely uh, do um, re reflect that. Uh, uh, different viewpoints, and um, uh, of course, I, I had the thing a moment ago, and uh, now of course I can't find it, uh, one one little bit. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but but we we'll, we will just ha have a look because I um I I do like to make sure that we uh, we, we we do uh, reflect. Uh, uh, alternate uh, um, alternate uh, uh, views in uh, our society, which don't normally get much of a, of a hearing, and uh, it, it's uh, necessary that they should. And uh, uh, that's, if I can find it, uh, we, we 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 should have uh, one of those. Um, here uh, this morning, and uh, I, I think I found it. Uh, and here it is: it's Liza Page and uh, Max Heard uh, uh, talking about uh, the uh, um, uh, the difference between old and young, and uh, the difference in viewpoints. 
Uh, so let's, with any luck at all, uh, can join them and find out what they have to say. Yeah. I haven't got it. Well, I, I've uh, led you down the garden path uh, because um, we, uh, uh, I couldn't find the thing. I, I put it away very neatly this morning. And, of course, uh, that was two hours ago. And I am completely incapable of, of uh, uh, finding it very quickly. Uh, so uh, um, th that will be for tomorrow. Uh, so you can look forward to um, uh, Liza Page and Max Erd uh, having a, a, a little natter and seeing things from a totally different point of view. And uh, it is uh, important, as I say, uh, to to do that. But one of the other things that will happen tomorrow is that in the evening, um, uh, hang on, where am I? Uh, yes, we're, we're into, uh, are we in Wednesday or Thursday? I can't remember. Uh, yeah, I, I, it's on Friday. On Friday, uh, that uh, Vince Cable is coming in, and will be interviewed by uh, 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 Liza uh, in front of a roaring fire, at the White Hart, and uh, uh, we uh, hear his response to, uh, as a, a senior politician, um, to um, to what they have to say. And uh, I, I just don't understand half the time why I can find these things when I don't want them uh, and I can't find them uh, when I do want them. And uh, isn't that uh, always the, uh, the, the truth of the matter? Um, <laughs> and uh, I, uh, uh, it's because I, I, I'm not bad at a broadcaster. When it comes to the, um, the the technical side of things, is uh, you can swallow me up and throw me out, and uh, it's uh, uh, it's uh, I um, I just don't I don't understand half of what goes on, and it's my age. It's age. It is age, um, and <laughs> it's. Uh, Uh, we, we, we have a, a wealth of stuff here. It's just um, try, trying to, uh, uh, to sort out where it is in the system. And that uh, is always a problem for me. It is always a problem for me, and I have to keep talking to you uh, while I'm, I'm trying to find some of the things which uh, we, we should... Uh, um, uh, uh, uh. Well, we've we, we got something here. Let's go. Uh. It's all right. No, I'm almost over. In ten minutes left.
I'm gonna take that and put it up there. Look for it. At the last few minutes, shall we? is the authority on Tom Paine, not just in Lewis, but throughout the English-speaking world. What he doesn't know about Tom is not worth knowing, but he does have other little tidbits tucked away as well. Yes, uh, the book I spent 10 years uh, intermittently, it's intermittent research this, I was doing other things at the same time, but um, I couldn't let it go after I was made uh, director of the Tom Paine Festival in 2009, celebrating 200 years of his life. Um, it was the 200th anniversary of his death, actually, but uh, the everyone wanted to do something in Lewis about that, because he lived here for six years, and uh, so I was appointed as festival director, and it was my duty to uh, mount a 10-day exhibition of his time of uh, celebrating his time in Lewis so it was quite a difficult thing to do actually because no up until that point very little was known about his time in Lewis in fact it turns out very little was known about his time in England before he left uh, these shores from from Lewis in some in 1774 he departs he arrives in Lewis in 1768 to the shores of America clutching a letter of introduction from the great Benjamin Franklin. So we did uh, we we did find out some things, and we wrote a little book, uh, uh, co-authored. Uh, I published, edited, and co-authored with uh, Dr. Colin Brent and Deborah Gage, who's a direct descendant of Sir Thomas Gage, who was Commander in Chief at the time the British lost America uh, to the War of Independence, as it were. So three three points of view. Colin deep in as as much as it was known then about Lewis. He's very uh, the eminent local eminent historian. Me just come off a degree in psychology, so I had an inquiring mind. I was trained at the time to inquire, if, if you like, in a forensic way. And um, and Deborah, who who, had a, who writes a very good essay about her, her ancestor, uh, and it's included in the book. So, but there was a missing bit. Was um, uh, Payne wrote the case of the officers of excise while he was here and 4,000 copies were printed of that. And all the accounts were that he was rabble-roused by, um, by members, other officers. He was an officer of excise here, and he was rabble-roused to do this thing. But um, a member of the Thomas Paine Society, uh, just deceased, had written a little book some years before about this, where he claimed Paine couldn't possibly have done that, actually. He probably couldn't do it now get the signatures of 3,000 officers of excise on a petition and write this case, which is the argument, to um, laying out the corruption within the excise service and the way uh, their wages have been frozen for a hundred years by law. And they observed the inflation, the rise of money in the country, like a map of Peru, Payne says. So anyway, I, um, the signatures were missing. And I started uh, working with the university on this, and we digitised the local newspaper. And I used to take students under my wing and go to the National Archives and fish around in the treasury boxes with uncatalogued uh, material. And I found some signatures. Um, I found two lots of signatures from officers uh, predating Payne's writing of the case by four years. And so there, there were cues were starting to. This was a very important cue, a clue. Um, clues were starting to emerge, but it was quite difficult to put it all together. And I put it, I had to put it to one side for, you know, because I couldn't quite see the picture. And it was only actually when I was, I gave up the doctoral study, because that wasn't, didn't seem to be getting me there. It was too wide a, a thing. Um, I wanted to do this specific thing, you know, how, how did this happen? 
And it was only actually uh, by writing it, the story came together in my mind. The clues started to click together. The logic started to make sense. And I checked it out with Bill Speck, probably the senior radical historian at that time, sadly deceased, lost poor Bill. And Professor Richard Watmer of the University of St Andrews who's taken on that mantle of the most senior radical historian in the UK and up there ranking in the world. So they, they checked my work as I went um, and um, signed it off as it were, you know, as, as a valid uh, piece of um, writing. And I published uh, under the Thomas Paine Society last year. And it's been out there, available for sale all over the world. Now I've given several talks uh, here and there, London, Benjamin Franklin's house, Thetford, his hometown, here in the keep, here in the town. History, historical society is slowly getting out there, but I just got a review in from by Jet Connor of the Journal of the American Revolution, where he um, marks it nine out of ten, and and marks it as as filling in that missing bit, or some of that missing bit. Um, very hard to find these clues, um, and uh, Richard Watmore said it describe the rise of Thomas Paine because that was the research question really how could someone very ordinary in six short years that he was in, living in Lewis come from here as a lowly officer of excise and just six years six and a half years later he wrote common sense or was jockeying up to write that which changed the world and caused almost directly gave the North American colonists the confidence to go to war. I'm sorry about the uh, the, the low sound there. Um, but, uh, there we are coming to the end of our uh, uh, since You can tell my voice has been working overtime this morning for almost three hours. Uh, and uh, so it is time to say uh, to the clip. Uh, Vince Cable tomorrow and uh, possibly uh, uh, we are trying to get hold of um, uh, Robert Hardman, who is the uh, Royal Barog Biographer and who is going to be in Lewis on the weekend to uh, uh, talk about his book. Uh, and uh, that's at the All Saints Centre. It is starting tomorrow, tomorrow um, it's starting Friday. Uh, I really have got lost uh, <laughs> this week. Uh, it's starting on Friday, I think it's tomorrow, uh, is the uh, Lewis a book festival um, and uh, Mark Rattray who organizes it does an excellent job in getting an all-star cast uh, so if you, uh, you you need only go to one uh, it's, uh, uh, you don't have to go there for all day it's on uh, uh, Friday Saturday and Sunday with a whole lineup of excellent speakers uh, so it, it is time for us to say uh, to the pip uh, and uh, I look forward to seeing you tomorrow morning uh, interesting Peter Metier uh, and, and some of the things that uh, he uh, uh, generated and uh, uh, have done some good works here in Lewis uh, quite often unsung. All right, Keith Hayes, Mirador Television, Toodlepip, see you tomorrow. <laughs>